Our next discussion will be about the revolution taking place in venture capital and private equity. And we are joined by some pioneers in the space. Uh, we have Alan Patrickoff, the founder of Graycroft. We have Steve Case, the founder of AOL and Revolution, and Gerald Parsky, the chairman and senior advisor of Aurora Capital. So welcome to you all, gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. So nice to be here. The word revolution can seem to have a lot of different meanings, but in the context of what we're talking about, it's really about a widespread change. So Alan, I want to start with you because you're a pioneer in the venture capital space. And as you look out today, what do you identify as one of the big changes that you're seeing right now? Well, I think that today is really an industry. I don't know, am I live? No. Yeah. <laughs> now I am. Uh, uh, I think that uh, today it's an industry. I mean, when I started out in 1970, uh, it was just a cottage group of people. I don't think, I, I'm trying to remember where they even called it venture capital. It was really uh, development capital business and uh, it gradually it didn't become actually an industry till 1976 or 77 when they formed the National Venture Capital Association so it was a disconnected group of people there wasn't syndications you you had to go out and search for deals today you sit in your office and uh, you're inundated particularly in the startup area um, people find it hard to believe that we see almost 100 new deals, and we're one of a couple of thousands of firms in the business. We see uh, at least 100 new deals every week. And that's between our office in New York and uh, Los Angeles. And that, that's not Boston and San Francisco. So, I mean, you can get an idea of just how much we're around. Plus, all the follow-on investments and, and the amount of capital in the business is extraordinary compared to what it was at that time. And Jerry, you're, you're up here representing the private equity space. What would you say is the revolution that you're seeing within your world? Well, I would characterize uh, it for private equity as an evolution, not a revolution. And I think um, I start with the proposition that historically, uh, I think there was a reference to you had one fund and you look kind of carefully at what you were going to, how you were going to diversify that, that fund. And if you had a growth company that you were looking to buy, um, reasonable leverage, kind of in the old economy, if you were there, um, you would buy the company at kind of maybe with some adjustments in EBITDA, but reported EBITDA with some adjustments eight times, seven times. Today, all of that is out the window. Keep in mind what was previously said about the political environment and the economic climate and the cycle we're in. Keep that in mind and we'll come back to it in a second. But you have, as I think Alan said, you know, over 2,000 firms and you have, I don't know, 750 billion to a trillion dollars of dry powder out there waiting to invest. So what is the consequence of that? People are put moving valuations up to astronomical levels, which will make it very difficult to achieve the returns that would justify an allocation to private equity. So now it's common for a GDP growth company to ha um, look to be bought at 12 times, 13 times, 14 times adjusted EBITDA. Adjustments for things that haven't quite happened. I kind of looked at uh, one recently that was um, run rate adjusted EBITDA at the end of the year. Now, come on. Uh, uh, so um, uh, I think what it takes now is to step back as an LP. Don't, don't uh, criticize a firm for keeping dry powder dry for a while. Um, and in fact, if they've had a good business uh, uh, for a while, um, maybe it's a good time to sell and realize on that business. But d don't, don't, uh, don't worry about people saying uh, dry powder, especially because there's uncertainty in the marketplace. The economy, uh, and what was described in our, in our first chat, are, are th these are clouds out there. Um, at some point, maybe we'll talk a little bit about California. I come from California. 
If you want to know what's coming across the country, just look at where California is, especially in the unfunded pension liabilities that exist. But, but today, how do, how do you navigate that in the private equity arena? Very cautiously. Um, you can look for businesses that um, you can bring operating improvements to bear. This isn't an environment where financial engineering can get you to the end zone. This is an environment where you have to take a good company and bring operating people to bear who have had a lot of experience. In our firm, an example is uh, Larry Bossidy, who's been chairman of our board. Um, he, a perfect example of this is not financial engineering. This is taking a good company and helping it get better. So very selective in private equity to navigate these waters, a recession that's coming I, I would kind of agree with the notion that 2021, not necessarily 2020, but if it's coming then, look for other things. Um, have specialization, uh, industrial specialization or industry specialization. Maybe look at creating a vehicle to invest for the long term. Um, uh, why are, are you forced in today's environment in private equity to buy and, and sell a business in four, three, four or five years. If you're buying it 15 times, there may be a, a multiple contraction. If you had the ability to grow a business carefully over 10 to 15 years, um, I think you'd do a lot better. And Steve, a lot of us know you as the founder of AOL, also the founder of Revolution, a DC-based venture capital firm, and you really champion this notion of the rise of the rest. Can you talk to us about what you've been doing, where you've been traveling, and the opportunities that you've been seeing outside of California? Sure. First of all, I should say uh, I was a beneficiary of that early first wave of venture capital. We started AOL in 1985 when only 3% of people were online. They're only online one hour a week, and most people didn't believe that the internet would ever account mount for anything, but Alan Patrickoff was one of our venture capital investors, so he, he believed and we'll always be, be grateful. I wish uh, I was. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, in terms of the rise of the rest, we launched this effort. I should also say that a couple of earlier speakers, David Rubenstein and Ray Dalio, are investors in this rise of the rest fund that we created because we believe there's a great arbitrage right now. The venture capital, obviously, is the jet fuel that kind of powers the innovation economy. Disruption is now happening across a lot of other sectors, healthcare, food and agriculture, smart cities, and, and so forth. Half of the Fortune 500 will likely turn over in the next 25 years, because that's happened each of the last several 25-year you know, periods. But overwhelmingly, that venture capital is invested on the coast. Last year, according to the NVCA, the Venture Capital Association tracked 75% of venture capital went to three states, California, New York, Massachusetts, 75%. The other 47 states are getting 25%. Connecticut, less than 1%. Virginia, less than 1%. Michigan, less than 1%. Ohio, less than 1%. Pennsylvania, less than 1%. California, more than 50%. And California is great. Silicon Valley was great. Will continue to be uh, the, the far and away the leading uh, kind of ecosystem for startup development. But it's crazy that essentially we're putting all our eggs in that basket and we're not diversifying more. And we're missing out as investors on what is a great arbitrage because the valuations in other places around the country, because of the classic econ 101 supply and demand, are lower. So rise of the rest is was designed to identify promising startup uh, ecosystem, identify interesting companies in those areas. We've now invested in over 100 companies in over 30 states. Just now last week, launched a second uh, 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 Rise the Rest uh, fund. And last week, we announced it in, in Detroit. And uh, the first unicorn out of that seed fund, it's an early stage seed fund investment uh, strategy, uh, raised $200 million, billion dollar valuation, went from six employees to 900 employees in three years in Detroit. And so, it, and we've seen a company, one of the companies we co-invested with, Allen and Graycroft, is, I think it was, you said at one point it was the most successful Graycroft investment, was in Birmingham. Uh, so we're seeing great entrepreneurs building great companies everywhere. We're trying to level the playing field, kind of be an advocate for those uh, you know, companies. And then when they scale from the seed stage to the venture stage to the growth stage, the revolution also has venture funds and, and growth funds. We're looking to back the, the most promising companies as they scale up. So I think this is a, 
and a story that is not being told. The, the, the entrepreneurs in different parts of the country are now starting to see multi-billion dollar exits. There's one you know, not too long ago in Ann Arbor, $3 billion, Go Security, one in Utah, Qualtrics, $7 billion, one in Miami, you know, Chewy, $3 billion. I mean, these are, these are significant you know, companies that are being built. The valuations at the early seed and venture stage are lower. Uh, so when these companies are successful, you can make more money. So over time, I think you'll see uh, venture capital uh, shift. The coastal investors will need to have more regional investment strategies, as, as Greycroft uh, has. More entrepreneurs will get back to more parts of the country. More big companies will build. More jobs will be created. That will have some broader political uh, uh, implications as well. But to me, it feels a little like the Internet 35 years ago when, when nobody other than a few like Alan believed in the idea of the Internet. Uh, and people, when I was talking about it, were skeptical. And people, when I talk about the rise of the rest and entrepreneurship in Detroit and Birmingham and other places, are skeptical. I look at some of the eyes out there, I see some skepticism. But I'm pretty confident over the next decade, uh, people will be surprised to see what, what happens in these different cities. And venture capital will, the revolution in venture capital will be more of a regional approach as opposed to a coastal approach. Well, I, have to, I have to, can I just add a little side story? I, between the, I, I use Twitter also once in a while. This morning, you should all read my tweet. Uh, it, it, I retweeted you. Yeah, oh, you did. Okay. Yes. Uh, about corporate governance. Uh, well, we in California don't tweet at all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, 25, 30, more than that, in the 80s, I was visiting Don Valentine, who was one of the great founders of the venture industry. He founded Sequoia. He was a real hero to the industry. He was written up. There was a, not an obituary, but a story about him yesterday in the Wall Street Journal. But when I was out seeing him, he said, like all the people in San Francisco, I don't go outside my zip code. I don't go any place that's more than an hour outside my office. I don't go outside my area code. And about a year later, they split 415 into 415 and 650. So I sent him a note at that point and said, your market has just been cut in half. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but we are, we are in uh, Indianapolis, Minneapolis, uh, Austin at Birmingham, where we did have one of our most successful investments, which we just sold recently. Uh, and we are very, and, and the truth is, it's hard to get venture capitalists to make a trip that involves more than one plane. They have to switch two planes. <laughs> that it, it makes it uncomfortable if you have to stay overnight. Uh, so it's depending a lot on local support. And there are an enormous number of local uh, incubators and, and startup uh, labs that are developing in every single city in the city. And the real challenge we found is attracting technical talent mm -hmm. to these areas. Uh, the ideas are there, the entrepreneurs are there, but getting uh, technical people to move to some of these smaller cities is tough. Which is really, I'd say, just move back. Most of the, you know, in, in Silicon Valley, move back in Silicon Valley, true. I spoke at a, a conference about 2,000 people about a year ago and asked for a show of hands how many people were from the Bay Area. Less than 5%. Everybody in Silicon Valley is from someplace else. <laughs> they grew up and went to school in Ann Arbor or in, 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 you know, in Chicago or other places, but they left. Massive brain drain over the last several decades because that's where the action was. That right. was where the money was. So the, the, the opportunity is to slow the brain drain, create enough opportunity locally where people d don't leave. And now Carnegie Mellon, Pittsburgh, more people are staying now than were staying 10 years ago, so that's encouraging. And then get the boomerang of people returning because they see the startup ecosystem growing. And so it's partly a capital issue, but also, as Alan says, partly a, a, a talent issue. Well, you all took my next question, which was, what is the challenge there? So I guess to segue from there, what do you think the future of talent looks like? And, and how, I mean, I'm a millennial. I moved from a small town in Virginia to New York City, and it would be really hard to get me to go back. So how do you convince people? Well, one thing I'd say about um, uh, concerns I have about the millennials, um, I, think if we're, I think if we're not careful, we're planting the seeds of not just an angry generation where people are angry. They're angry at the fact that uh, there's such a wide gap between those that have made it and those that haven't. They're angry because if they, if they don't qualify for financial aid in, a, in college uh, and they don't, can't afford it, they have to take out a loan, they're not quite sure. So we have to create or help create an environment where people are prepared for the jobs that are going to be available. But I also saw one other uh, poll, I'm not, ha having been involved slightly in, in some of the political activities um, I, I, th I think I understand some polls. There was a poll of millennials 
uh, that I was fascinated by because it said 20, about 25% who were polled didn't have a friend. Didn't have a friend. So it's not just an angry generation, but it is an angry, potentially lonely generation that if we're not careful. So we, the generation above, the mentors for the next generation have to be thinking about how our educational system can prepare young people for the jobs that are be available and have to create environments outside of these two or three city centers where, uh, where they can earn a living, um, enjoy, uh, raise a family. Um, and this is a challenge that if we're not careful about, we are gonna have a very disruptive both economy and social system here. Well, just to add to that, the, if you look at the data on venture capital, I mentioned 75% goes to three states. If you looked at the last election, President Trump won 30 states. If you add up all the venture capital that went to all 30 states, it was 15%, one five. And given that venture capital, a correlation between venture capital, fast growing companies that end up creating a lot of, of jobs is, 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 is pretty clear. We shouldn't be surprised that there are a lot of people in a lot of parts of the country that are kind of feeling kind of left out and left behind, because they are kind of being left out and left behind. To answer to your question, the, the, the people should have the flexibility and, and the opportunity to move wherever they want to move, obviously. But they also should have the opportunity to stay where they are if they choose to stay where they are. And a lot of people are, do not really have that opportunity today. They feel like they had to leave to pursue their, their career, pursue their dreams. So slowing that brain drain is, is critically important. Creating more of an opportunity for people to come back is critically important. And just two weeks ago, LinkedIn published some research that says now more people are leaving San Francisco than moving to San Francisco. It's hit a little yeah. bit of a tipping point because it is a wonderful city. There are a lot of great things happening, but it's an expensive city and there's a lot of traffic and, and other challenges that people are dealing with. And some of those people, not all, but some of those people actually would rather move back to some place where they came from or went to school and or their spouse has some connection in some other part of the country. Up until now, the opportunities have generally not existed there. And as we see these rising cities, more and more of these breakout you know, successes, you'll see an acceleration of that, which will then, we think, accelerate the potential investment returns here because that arbitrage around, arbitrage around valuation exists. But having the talent to scale these companies, go from dozens to hundreds to thousands of people, is a challenge. And but the way to deal with that challenge is to create more mobility around talent and create more opportunities for more people in more places so they can start a company wherever they want you know, or join a company wherever they choose to live. That applies also to private equity. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm looking at this uh, notion of creating longer term capital, capital that can, can uh, invest in companies for the longer term. And in cities other than the ones you mentioned out there, there are, there are uh, family owned entities uh, where the owners don't wanna sell to a private equity firm in an auction because they know they're gonna get resold again in three or four years. If you are willing to get out and beat the bushes to some extent uh, and allow family owned businesses to keep a, a, an interest as they're growing, what's ha what can happen in private equity will match what uh, Alan and Steve are saying on, on, on uh, venture capital. So, Steve, I've talked to Gene about this. Um, you know, your wife. <laughs> Uh, there's a really <laughs> small percentage. Well, well, well. There's a really small percentage of VC funding that goes to women, right. and it's even smaller for people of color. How can we bridge that, fix that, maybe reach parity at some point? So here's the data on that, which is which is pretty scary. Last year, over 90% of venture capital went to men, less than 10% to women, less than 1% went to African Americans. So if you just look at the data, you know, it's a great entrepreneurial nation. I'm proud of it. We all should be proud of it. But it does matter where you live. It does matter what you look like. And it does kind of matter what school you went to, who you know, who's in your network. If you have an idea, you have a, a genuine shot at the American dream. So the challenge, how do you level the playing field uh, so the opportunity exists for everybody everywhere? Uh, and what we've seen with Rise to Rest, and it's more of a place-based strategy. We're going to different cities, working in different cities. We have co-invested now with over 200 regional venture firms around the, you know, the country. We've built really strong networks, so we do have you know, tremendous uh, deal flow. But if you're paying attention and you're going, making the effort to you know, go to these, these places, even though it takes a little more, uh, more time, the, the diversity of the entrepreneurs you meet is much better. 45% of the companies we've backed 
are founded by women or people of color. In the last pitch competition we do, we do have these road trips around and bus tours and so forth. Four of the five last winners were, were women. So they're out there. You just have to make more of an effort to, 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 to find I, them. I, I think adding that, yeah, I don't, our percentage is not as good as what Steve said, but we have a pretty good percentage. My first partner was a woman when I first mm -hmm. started Apex. My first partner at Great Crop was a woman, and we've backed many, many women in business, and we have a lot in the firm. I think it has a lot to do with the attitude of the people who are working in firms like us and being receptive. Right. For us, it makes absolutely no difference. I mean, we have lots of women entrepreneurs. They have as much chance of getting finance as anybody else. Uh, but there is a, for some, it could be, you know, Steve, that there aren't as many women coming and soliciting with business plans for these well, deals. Or they, or mean, they can't figure one, out how to get in, get, it, get, get their, in the their email read or their, their get, you know, get a meeting. So, I mean, it's going to take effort. You know, this whole, you know, it goes back to my early experience with, the, with AOL and the Internet. That first decade was really hard. Like, we believed in the idea of the world getting online. It was really hard. Most people didn't, you know, why would somebody actually sit down and type a message to somebody when you can just pick up the phone and call somebody? I mean, it was not obvious why it would take off. Eventually, a lot of hard work, a lot of people, a lot of partnerships, so forth. Eventually, it took off. This idea of leveling the playing field around entrepreneurship and, and place is going to be, uh, you know, critically important. You know, people are going to be critically important. The other point I think we should emphasize is that in terms of this revolution in venture capital is the nature of the kinds of companies that are going to be created that are hugely disruptive is going to change. And what's happened in the first wave of the internet companies like AOL it was quite different than what happened in the second wave. And I think now we're seeing the third wave. And two in particular we're focusing on policy is much more important for this next wave of, of entrepreneurship, regulatory issues, uh, because of whether it be drones in the skies or autonomous vehicles or medical device safety or what have you, understanding the policy side of things is going to be much more important. And partners are going to be more important. It's not going to be dropping an app in the app store and hoping like Snapchat or something it just spreads virally. You ha you, the software, the coding is going to be the table stakes to get in the game, the partnerships you form. Healthcare, for example, you can't get the doctors using it, the hospitals embracing it, the health plans paying for it, the government allowing it. You're, you're, you have no shot. And so we need to understand that where entrepreneurship is happening is beginning to shift, and the kinds of things entrepreneurs are going to have to do to be successful are going to you know, be shifting. And that's obviously a focus of what we're trying to do at Revolution, sort of the rise of the rest and the third wave of the Internet. Well, kind of, oh, go ahead. It shows you a little bit uh, I, I, that you have to be, as an investor, as an LP, um, selective about uh, the people that you are in, you're committing to at this point in time. No substitute for really examining the GP of venture capital or the GP, if for that matter, of, uh, of private equity uh, uh, that, that um, returns uh, in, uh, before uh, in private equity and venture capital. You say, oh, well, uh, uh, we'll, we'll make an uh, 18 to 20 percent net return. I've, I've seen some analysis that basically says, well, we'll settle for. At, uh, in today's environment, a 10% return net. I, I would say to an LP, why would you commit your money tied up in private equity or venture capital if that's what you're going to achieve? Take a look at any S&P index fund over any period of time. It's not worth the liquidity uh, uh, that, uh, uh, tie up that you have for that kind of return. I do want to shift gears a little bit and just talk about some of the more current uh, news, specifically exits, IPOs, what we just saw with WeWork. And Alan, I'd like to get your thoughts on this. We talked about the dual class share structure. What are your thoughts there? Is this something that's, is, are these, is this a pro? Is this a con? How do you think about that? Um, you know, I'm obsessed with that subject uh, of dual class shares. And I was pleased today that, uh, the division fund has now decided not to invest in companies with dual class shares. Uh, the uh, took a while. Uh, I think that everyone should read the WeWork prospectus if you can get a hold of it. Uh, it's 350 pages and it's a seminal piece. About 10, 15 years ago, the SEC passed something which was called plain speech, which enabled you not to have stiff language, but to be more relaxed, like you were, you know, talking to real people. And this is the absolute height of simple, uh, with all kind of emotional appeals and, and adjusted, adjusted 
uh, <laughs> uh, EBITDA uh, numbers that will just are mind blowing. So I think that was a seminal event. It's worth reading to know this was, I guess it's not the, it's the bottom of where you're going to hit. And from there on, I think it's had a, it's going to have, it's having already a real impact on any company that's been in the uh, uh, backlog of companies pretending to go, pre getting ready to go public and making them look again at, at how their corporate structure is set up, how their capital structure, uh, excuse me, how their cap table is set up, how their directorship is set up, uh, and how they report their earnings. And I think there's going to be a lot more scrutiny uh, about companies who really don't have an economic model that works yet, uh, that has not been proven. Not they're making money, but the, the model itself doesn't show that it has an economic vi viability. So I think that is a, uh, we're an important event. Uh, when I used to speak, well, let me go back. When I started Greycroft in 2006, I said we didn't expect any company we had in the portfolio to get sold in a public offering because the IPO market had just disappeared. And it was true until, honestly, the end of 2018, we were 100% correct. Nothing went public. <laughs> uh, uh, but we sold a lot of companies in private transactions. I have been saying for the last six or nine months, I think we have changed. I think we're now at a period of time when the IPO market has opened up. And it closes very quickly, by the way. I think it's opened up, but it's going to be more, a little more discriminating than it was in the first few months of the year. And a lot of companies got out and people are taking second looks and seeing if the emperor has clothes on. So uh, I'm, I'm positive about the outlook that there will be a lot more companies going public. Remember, there are a lot of companies that have been private for a lot longer than they would have been in the past that are, were able to finance privately because there was so much money in the later stage funds, they just kept feeding huge amounts of capital that enabled the uh, founders to get liquid, get s selling shareholders to get liquid. And uh, we're now at a point in time when the next step has to be through a public market to get, market to get full liquidity. I, I agree with uh, Alan and, and our, on the revolution growth side, we have several companies, Sweet Green and Clear and, and uh, Scopely that have raised money at well over a billion dollars in the private markets. And the late stage private markets have been you know, quite robust. Uh, that's be, you know, a little bit of air is coming out of that, which I think is healthy. I think the IPL market, even some other concepts, direct listing, other things are beginning to kind of play out, which I think is super important. I, I worked with President Obama on passing something called the Jobs Act that changed some of the rules around going public and using crowdfunding. Just talked a couple weeks ago, the SEC chairman is very concerned about you know, democratizing access to the innovation economy right now. Essentially, when the companies go public, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of fully developed. There's not much upside. When AOL went public in 1992, the first internet company to go public, we raised $10 million in our IPO. They, a value that day was $70 million. And 10 years later, it was $160 billion. And all that upside was captured by, by retail investors. That dynamic has has, is really not the case anymore. And figuring out ways to give uh, you know, kind of retail investors in a smart way access to these uh, these growth companies earlier in the cycle, I think, is is uh, critically important. And and some of that will just as as some of that late stage, what's sometimes called tourist growth capital, pulls out of the market when there is a little bit of a, a hiccup. That likely will accelerate things. But ultimately, companies should be thinking about. You know, going public as, as, as vibrant, independent companies, that's certainly what we uh, urge our entrepreneurs to think about. You can't underestimate how important that Jobs Act that Steve's, I mean, really dedicated, I think, a couple of years to, but uh, how it's opened up the private markets to uh, democratize the, so that ev almost everybody can participate now, whether they're accredited or not accredited. Jerry, anything that you want to add? Uh, well, I think I do think that in this environment, we heard a lot about the political climate and the cycle. And I do think that certainly investing in private equity, you need to be very careful, especially when the values are being driven up this way. I, I'd only say uh, that um, there are some dark clouds coming from California that I'm not sure people on the East Coast fully appreciate. I, I uh, chaired two commissions for uh, Governor Schwarzenegger kind of California's answer to Donald Trump, but, uh, <laughs> uh, um, but, but, the, com but the commissions were, were one on tax reform and one on public pension reform. And the unfunded liabilities in California, health care for, uh, for public employees in 2010, uh, that's school districts, cities, counties, state, 118 billion. 
for CalPERS and CalSTRS, the state obligations, and the University of California, about 70 billion of that. Uh, these are unfunded liabilities. They're liabilities that will become due. They somehow don't appear on the state budget. They, they just uh, they evaporate. And so we came up with one simple re recommendation. We said, um, we think that what you ought to do is pre-fund. Don't, don't, we're not going to advocate changing the defined benefit plans to defined contribution plans, which perhaps we should have. Seven Democrats on this commission, seven Republicans, I chaired it. And I, I thought, my goodness, uh, if, we do, if we recommend that change, it'll be seven to seven. Why have seven to seven? So one simple recommendation, uh, and that was pre-fund your obligations. And oh, by the way, for this uh, 75 billion that's going to come due, uh, we did a kind of an actuarial study and came up with if you set aside 1.6 billion a year for about 14 years out of a budget that was then 125 billion, that the earnings, four to five percent, on those on that and accumulation of principal would fund these obligations. So the Republican mem member said, great, uh, go ahead, Jerry, go talk to the Democrats. You know them so well. I said, OK. I went over there and they said, I'm sorry. Uh, we can't support that. I said, well, why? They said, well, we have other priorities for uh, this 1.6 or 1.7 billion you want. We'll deal with the future. I said, well, wait a minute now. You want me to get up as the chairman of this commission and say that you have a higher priority than ensuring your union members that they're going to get their health care. Oh, you can't say that. Why not? That's what you're doing. Unanimous recommendation. Nothing has happened. Nothing has happened to deal with that. That 75 billion is now approaching 175 billion and growing. This is a cloud that is hovering over California and it will impact the economy. It will impact people willingness to stay. And you couple that with a tax system that drives people away. And this is a cloud coming, and you have to be really careful about it. Well, gentlemen, on that note, I'd like to thank my panel. <laughs> that optimistic note. Jerry, I didn't Stephen, want the Allen. First, I didn't want the thank first, you so much. I didn't want thank the you. first chat to be too negative. <laughs>